Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and uh, we've got a, a great guest for you today. Joining me is Matthew Peterson. Uh, before we get to that, I just want to remind everybody that you can go and follow me and the podcast on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And also, I'm not sure if you've seen yet, but we just announced that we're going to be hosting a virtual investor conference August 3rd through the 6th. It's called the SNN Network Virtual Investor Conference. I invite you all to go in and register and check it out. We got awesome companies presenting, great panels and keynotes. I'm very excited about that lineup that we're putting together. Um, some stuff that you really have never seen before, uh, as well as doing one-on-ones with companies there. And uh, yeah, go to conference.snn.network and click the register button. And uh, feel free to shoot me an email or tweet if you have any questions or comments. Now, like I said, I got Matthew Peterson on today. He is from Peterson Capital Management. Quick little background on Matthew. Let me just read you right here. He's the managing partner of Peterson Capital Management LLC. Peterson Capital or Peterson Investment Fund One was established in 2011 as a capital allocation vehicle with a mission to build enormous wealth for long-term partners. And we just became best friends. Is that cool? That, I think we can say that, right? So uh, yeah, what, sounds great, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> with that, what's up, Matthew? How are you doing today, man? Doing very well. Thanks for having me on. You have a great podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm stoked to have you on. So, uh, you know, as we always do here, love to get your background and, and really understanding better, where did your passion for investing start? So let's go from there. Passion for investing. Okay. Well, <clears throat> you know, I've been working in the financial industry professionally for over two decades. So um, really, you know, back in the 90s, started with internships. It, it led me out to a career on Wall Street where I was doing consulting for investment banks like Goldman Sachs, uh, primarily in the risk management space. Uh, and um, I always was sort of putting the building blocks in place to, to launch my own firm. Uh, so in 2011, uh, I kicked that off and, and we launched Peterson Capital Management. Got it. So, so, you know, just quick follow up there. I mean, what was it about investing? I mean, where, you know, do, do you have one of those stories where, you know, you had a, you had a job as a kid or parents influence, you know, like what, what was it? What was that first? You're like, okay, this is it. This is for me. I'm done. Sure. Look, I think, you know, maybe it's a little cliche, but uh, when I was, I, I, I was passionate about investing from a very young age. So uh, actually when I was um, probably eight or nine years old, uh, I, I was saving uh, some meager allowance and put some uh, recycling bins in my father's law firm uh, and began recycling the soda cans uh, there and then bringing them in and, and kind of picking up five cents a piece. And, um, it was a pretty good business for a young kid. Actually, I ended up, uh, saving a fair amount and soon, uh, you know, moved from the piggy bank to the real bank and then began trading, uh, you know, CDs when I realized you could get higher interest rates if you were willing to lock your capital up for three or six months. Uh, in fact, there's, uh, there were a couple of times when we would have these, um, I, would, I would have trouble with the tellers who wouldn't uh, make the obvious exchange for me because I didn't have my parents there signing. Uh, and so they were refusing to give me the better rates because my parents were not with me. But uh, I, had always, I had always been in, um, I, I started a few businesses as a child and had always had a pretty entrepreneurial spirit uh, and, um, and really got into uh, the stock market in my late teens. So, I mean, what was it about, what, what would you say was about the stock market even that you're like, all right, I, I think this is where I want to, I want to take my, my, my investing passion to, as opposed to, you know, any of the other vehicles that are out there. Well, you know, if we, if we go deep, I've, I've always enjoyed uh, math and economics and, um, and studying businesses in general. Uh, and so I think that's probably something that led me to that to that area. Also, investing in general tends to put you on this sort of intellectual treadmill where you can constantly be learning about new things, studying new areas. Uh, and so I just, I, I personally, uh, not everybody would agree with this, but I personally just find it very interesting. I, I enjoy getting up and reading about, uh, you know, 
some new business opportunity or picking up a, a 10K or 10Q and, um, and studying that. It's a, it's a, a passion of mine and, um, and I don't know how else to explain it, but I've, I've just always enjoyed it and, and I've just been pursuing what I enjoy. Very cool. All right, so uh, as you said, you know, everything led to you establishing Peterson Capital Management. Uh, as we said, that the, the first fund was, was back in 2011. So can you explain, you know, what were all the, the factors that finally led to you? Like, all right, time to open my own shop. Let's do this. Uh, what are the factors that led to it? You know, I was, I was uh, even in undergrad, I was, I was planning at some point to have my own firm. I just sort of felt that it would be valuable to get enough uh, to get some some experience before I launched into it, and um, and so that's what that's what led me to to Wall Street. And in fact, um, uh, you know, I sort of I, I've spent probably seven years uh, going between uh, New York and London, and um, and it was a, a really really wonderful experience. I mean, it was very very educational, uh, but but I I sort of was just trying to put all these pieces together. So I could, so I could build this firm and, and I don't know where, I don't know, I don't, I can't recall the time when I decided this is what I was going to do. I sort of just always thought, uh, you know, I'd like to be in finance and I'd like to run my own fund. Got it. All right. So we're now, we're now going to dive deep. We're getting to that. We're at that point in the podcast. Where we're going to talk philosophy and strategy. So we're there. What would you say is, is, Peterson Capital's investing philosophy. Okay, well, <clears throat> you know, we run a long-term concentrated portfolio. And, uh, and so similar to uh, the value strategies you would see out there, uh, this, this standard is, of course, you know, from a philosophy perspective that we look at our ownership of, of um, these shares as ownership of a business. Uh, we evaluate the opportunities on a you know bottom up uh, fundamental basis, uh, looking to buy things, for example, with a margin of safety, and uh, and something that is I think uh, sh should probably be done a little more even in the value community is that we also have a very concentrated portfolio. And we concentrate only on our best ideas uh, and try not to over uh, diversify. Got it. All right. I mean, is, is there anything more to that? Cause I know I was going through your website and, and looking at the, at, at the firm's investing philosophy. And I noticed that as you stayed on there, you embrace market volatility, you know, so can you explain a little bit more about what this means and, and how do you use market volatility to your advantage? Yeah, sure. I think, so I'll touch on that in a few ways. I'm, I'm sure uh, somewhere in my material, I say we embrace uh, market volatility, but that probably requires clarification because like any portfolio manager, we are not looking to have a volatile portfolio. Okay. But we do recognize that, uh, you will have some volatility in your portfolio. If you have a concentrated portfolio, that is simply the nature of, uh, the, the mathematics underlying things. And so, uh, we cannot ignore that there will be volatility. And of course, um, I can sort of dive into, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we, we do take advantage of volatility in certain ways. I think from a philosophy perspective, we're also, I kind of look at opportunities through two lenses. So in the value community, uh, you know, everybody's very familiar with, with Benjamin Graham and sort of the, the um, cigar butt opportunities. And I think those are, those are fantastic when you can find a dollar uh, that you can buy for 50 cents. Um, and that's certainly one bucket and things that are interesting to us. But uh, the other bucket and things that I would actually prefer are more the, the Phil Fisher um, philosophy, where uh, maybe you can buy that dollar at a discount, but that dollar is actually compounding that dollar continues to grow. And that's, that's a little more uh, exciting to us. And a lot of times when you find those opportunities, it's due to uh, there being volatility in the marketplace. Uh, so volatility is somewhat a function of uncertainty. And, um, and when there's uncertainty, 
uh, and the prices are swinging around. If you have a true, you know, bottom up fundamental um, assessment of the intrinsic value of the business, it provides you a real opportunity to maybe move in at um, something far below the value of the company. Fair enough. I mean, that, that's interesting that you bring that up because it actually, it sounds like it opens up your potential investing opportunities out there by, you know, not, not just looking for things that might be undervalued, but even, hey, it might be fair value, but it's a good business. So why not get in when it's at fair value and watch it compound over time, right? That's right. That's, that's exactly right. Um, yes. Makes sense to me. <laughs> so, so, so I also have to ask them when you're, when you're going out and looking for new ideas, I mean, do you guys tend to be more quantitative in your approach or do you also embrace a bit of qualitative into your, into your uh, strategy? I, well, it's, it's actually uh, a very strong combination of, of both aspects. Uh, if you'd like, I can sort of, so we have a, we have a pretty strict process uh, and I've sort of bucketed into four key aspects that I can talk through and you can see that there's qualitative and quantitative nature um, in, in both. Uh, and I can maybe point some of those out, but uh, you know, the first, the first step and things that some of your viewers might appreciate is that um, you know, the SEC requires uh, funds to file 13F reports every quarter. And uh, for, for high-frequency traders or things of that nature, it's totally meaningless 45 days after the, the quarter ends. But for, uh, for long-term value investors, especially concentrated portfolio managers, uh, you know, especially those in the public eye, so you can track, you know, are they better with REITs or are they better with uh, you know, technology firms, where, where do their, where's their true circle of competence? When, when those managers are out there, um, doing maybe, uh, you know, putting millions of dollars worth of research and, and then allocating, uh, hundreds of millions into a single position, uh, in maybe a 10 portfolio, 10 position portfolio, that's something very interesting. And that's, that's really where we start. Uh, and it, it eliminates all sorts of errors. So I track, probably a hundred different managers monitor their 13 apps and just sort of use that loosely as guidelines um, to sort of throw up a whole bunch of potential opportunities for our own portfolio. Um, so rather than sifting through, I mean, screening doesn't work. So, so many folks are out there putting a bunch of uh, ratios into some sort of Google screener or more sophisticated, you know, capital IQ screener. And, um, and it's, it's sort of, it will give them the results, but it'll give them a bunch of, of false positives. And uh, I think there's a way to really cut through the noise and identify maybe a few, maybe a couple hundred securities that might be uh, very interesting. And, um, and so there's that aspect. Then I move into the fundamental analysis component and the fundamental analysis uh, crosses both the quantitative and the qualitative piece. So, Quantitatively, I'm just looking for the standard account. I mean, everything you've learned in your, your CFA program, MBA program, whatever it is, you, it's the, the fundamental accounting aspect. You know, how are their cash flows look? How do their margins look? Uh, you know, how strong is this business? But then it's the things you would hear Charlie Munger and Buffett talk about, right? Where are their, uh, you know, wh wh where's the moat of this particular business? Um, and I sort, of, I sort of look at it uh, at a very high level, I want to find the top quality business models, uh, the, mo the strongest business models. I want to find the top managers and I want to find the deepest value. And I think if you can get sort of uh, that Venn diagram to work in your favor, uh, you're in a really good position. Because if you have a strong business model, uh, if you have a strong business model, but you have terrible management, they can actually destroy the cash flow that it's bringing in. Uh, but it, the, and the challenge, of course, is that if you have a strong business model with exceptional management, the valuation's usually uh, too high. And so one area I've been um, finding uh, much more success in is to find off financial statement value. And I think uh, that, and, and at the highest level, that is a moat. If you recognize that this business naturally is pursuing some sort of deferred gratification strategy, 
that doesn't show up anywhere on their financial statements, but their customers probably appreciate that. And it's probably a stickier business than someone who's operating somewhere else. So that's quantitative. And then there's the qualitative pieces that I, that I just mentioned. Um, the third step in our process uh, and something that is so valuable right now, I think if your viewers are out there buying securities, whether they're fund managers themselves or individual investors, this is like a generational opportunity, uh, is how to buy these securities. So you've narrowed down this one position you'd like to incorporate. How are you gonna buy it? Most people the last 100 years just use market or limit orders, but you can actually, and what we do, is we will write a cash secured put contract as a tool to own that equity. And that's another way that volatility really enhances our portfolio. So, uh, you know, what I'm, what, I'm, uh, what I'm talking about here is basically writing a put uh, with the intention of buying the security. Uh, the price of the put is a function of uh, Black Scholes, you know, Black Scholes feeds in a function of volatility. So when you have really high volatility, like the time we're in right now, we're in exceptionally high period of volatility and prices have come down. People are now willing to pay you enormous premiums to sell you their own shares. So you get their shares at a discount, plus they're paying you sometimes enormous uh, amounts for, for um, your commitment to buy those securities. That's it, just a huge advantage. Uh, I don't want to go through every portfolio position or something, but we have recently uh, been pursuing uh, something. Uh, we owned it for a while before, a Seritage, which is a REIT. Uh, Buffett owns some. Uh, there's a, a Eddie Lampert is, um, controls the spinoff of the real estate out of the Sears property. Stock price has gone from 45 to, let's say, seven, eight. And uh, and most people don't recognize that Berkshire owns the debt and is actually lightening the covenants on that debt. Uh, they're not looking to file, have them file bankruptcy or have a liquidity crisis. They're looking to have them get through this uh, difficult time. And, uh, but they're thrown in this commercial real estate uh, bucket with everybody else. The, the, I've gone asset by asset and recognize about $5 billion in value. And uh, you know there's $1.7 billion in debt, which leaves maybe 3 billion in long-term value for the equity. Uh, and uh, it's maybe selling for uh, 400, 400 million. So maybe there's eight or 10 X potential in this particular security. So uh, <clears throat> instead of buying the shares for eight, you can write a put contract, commit to buying it for eight and, uh, and receive, you know, three or four dollars for that particular commitment. So what that means is if you were to receive $4 uh, on an $8 commitment for an $8 security, you then hold $4 of your own. And at expiration, um, if the shares are above the strike price, the contract's over, you keep $4 on the $4 collateral, you've just made 100% and didn't even own the stock. Uh, if the shares fall, you have a margin of safety down to four uh, where you would buy. And so that's a very interesting aspect. You can do it on, every, on all sorts of securities from Berkshire Hathaway. We were just paid a 24.5% IRR on a commitment to buy Berkshire Hathaway for $165 a B share, just an astonishing price. And, um, and this is very rare. I, we will, this is, it is, it is uh, the VIX just hit its all time record of 85. Uh, there have been over the last, I think, 40 years, about five times where it's been in the high 30s. Uh, it just hit 85, which means suddenly uh, the premiums of these contracts have gone up to 20, 30, 40 percent of the entire price of the stock, which is just uh, uh, incredible. Uh, so that's sort of how we buy. And um, you could also use different products, warrants or uh, there were TARP warrants available uh, for many years that were quite interesting. And then finally, uh, the fourth step in our process is the actual portfolio allocation process. And that's where we wrap in sort of the Kelly criterion, focus a lot on not over diversifying, but having a concentrated portfolio. Uh, and uh, 
and really looking to, to allocate the capital very effectively in a pretty aggressive manner. Man, we have so much to unpack right there. I feel like we could do an episode <laughs> on literally each bucket that you just said. So let, I'm going to take it. I'm gonna t- I want to start first with, your, with this unique buying strategy and, and embracing this market volatility. I, I know we talked about it earlier, but I feel like was this strategy something that you've always done or because the VIX has hit these all-time highs that you're like, okay, we clearly can do this right now and we see an opportunity to make some money and also own companies at a steep discount at prices that we never thought we'd be able to get them at? It's a, it's a great question, Robert. Uh, <clears throat> so once I recognized that this opportunity existed and that occurred in about 2005 uh i stopped buying through traditional market and limit orders in the new york stock exchange this is the only way i buy securities uh in personal accounts uh in my portfolio there's just no reason to pay full market price if somebody's willing to pay you a premium to buy their stock uh you can Spread these out, uh, you know, the, some, the expiration can, can be very short term. So if you need to buy something soon, you could just have it expire this weekend. Uh, or you could sell a contract that expires two years from now. And um, so as long as the products exist, and there are certain situations where they, uh, where they don't exist, I will consider them on the basis of IRR. And if the IRR is sufficient to justify going through that method, I will use that method. So uh, let me make that a little more clear. There are many times when, let's say, uh, you want to own, let's just, you want to own a company like Berkshire Hathaway. People aren't often willing to pay very high premiums because what they're really doing is buying insurance on their own portfolio. And we're selling them that insurance. We know something about the company, right? The the price of these, the Black-Scholes model is strictly quantitative. And so if you have a qualitative edge, you understand the intrinsic value of this business. Uh, These things can be mispriced. And... uh, from a qualitative perspective. Uh, but oftentimes, if you went out a year on Berkshire Hathaway, you're not gonna get a double digit IRR. So it doesn't really seem worth uh, the investment. Uh, so you need to always look at it from an opportunity cost perspective. Uh, but once you've done that, if the IRR is sufficient, I would always use this as an approach to buy the securities. And oftentimes, when something falls into our buy zone, uh, it has declined in value, which means its local vol has increased and the premiums have increased. So you quite often have the dynamic where uh, the security you want to buy is falling, the premiums are increasing, and you can earn very, very significant IRRs through this method. So I just want to be fully transparent with my audience. When it comes to options, I'm a complete dunce. I, <laughs> I, 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 wish, I, knew, I wish I knew more about options, but I, every time I get into it, I'm like, uh okay got it for sure you know so i mean for for those who are maybe like me we're yeah. dunces with options you know exa- exactly you explained it already a little bit but but let's take a deeper dive how exactly does this buying strategy really work and h- how can it potentially go wrong as well sure uh so and i'll, I'll add that for many years i was reluctant to speak publicly about uh about this opportunity because I thought that it would just be exploited. Uh, in, in your entire audience, there's maybe two or 3%, I think that will actually go out and start looking at this more carefully. So I've become more comfortable. It's not a huge market. Uh, so for, uh, in layman's terms, uh, a call option gives you the right to buy a security, a put option gives you the right to sell a security. Uh, And that's sort of option 101. We're flipping it over. A covered call would give you the right to sell a security and a cash secured put 
would give you the right to buy the security, right? So you're transacting with an individual through the Chicago Board of Exchange. And uh, the way that this is uh, executed is through any broker, uh, or I would I, I think even a Robinhood an account, for example, uh, you go in and you register as sort of a more advanced option expert. Uh, sometimes you have to sign a document uh, saying, indicating you know uh, how this is working. And then you're allowed to write these contracts rather than just buy these contracts. So you're able to sell these contracts. And I sell them as a limit order. So uh, let's, let's take, uh, let's take uh, Seritage as an example, since we discussed it a moment ago. Uh, and let's say hypothetically, I think the price might be at, at 10 now. Uh, so let's say the price is 10 and, and we sort of look at the value as maybe being up in the 40s. Uh, we may be willing to buy Seritage for 10 going out until October. And there are contracts that exist out until October and January. And uh, so we would go in and we would specify the time frame. We'd specify the price we're willing to pay, which might be $10 a share. And then we'd specify the price that we would be willing to sell this contract for. And these prices are extremely volatile. Uh, so if we see that the market is sort of offering $3 a share for these contracts, uh, we might just list it at five. And, um, and I would put in a limit order and say, yeah, we'd be willing to sell you the contract to buy Seritage for 10 through October for five bucks. And uh, if somebody bought that from us, I would be quite surprised, uh, but it happens. And, um, and then we simply wait uh, you know, until October when that contract expires. And if the price is above 10, uh, we don't get to buy the securities, but we do keep the premium. So we always keep the five. Uh, and if the price is below 10, we now buy it for 10. But remember, five of it came from the counterparty. So we get into this sh these stocks for a net cash outflow of five. And uh, so if the shares fall to eight, we're actually still up 60% uh, uh, at the time that we buy because our net cash outflow was only five. So uh, how can this go right and wrong. I, I, I sort of can, I spoke on this, uh, I spoke on this in Switzerland a few years ago. And so I sort of described it in these four buckets. Uh, the first thing is, you know, the firm, which would of course be a terrible scenario, but it's a total mistake, totally wrong. Firm goes to zero, right? You sold some puts on, on Hertz and, uh, and it goes to zero. So that's a terrible scenario, of course. Uh, if it happened with Seritage, it would mean instead of buying it for 10. So you have to look at the alternative. Okay. Uh, if you are going to buy it anyway, and the market price is 10, you could buy it for 10 and it goes to zero. Or you sell the put contract, you get paid five, it's falling, you now buy it for 10, which costs you net five, and it goes to zero. So instead of losing 10, you lose five. Uh, so it's not as bad as losing uh, the full price of the equity, but it's, of course, a terrible scenario. Uh, then there's the best scenario, which is the price dips a little bit right into the sweet zone between sort of the net cash outflow and the strike price, uh, where you buy the security that you want to own. And that's, that's the very best scenario. Um, it actually causes volatility in the portfolio because these premiums can go up while you're holding them and you're essentially short them. So it does introduce a little volatility. But, uh, but I, I, you know, you ultimately own the shares for five. And, um, and when the shares reach 40, incidentally, if you bought for 10, you make, you know, four, you make 4x or whatever. And if you bought for five, now you're making 8x. So it's a huge difference when you lower that denominator in your IRR calculation. Uh, the third bucket is it goes up a little bit. Uh, and that's actually okay as well. So if it expired and the shares were at 12, we might get another chance to sell more contracts and, um, and that'd be okay. We make hundred percent. The market was up maybe 20% from 10 to 12. Uh, so that's the third bucket. The fourth bucket, which bothers me quite a bit, but doesn't really bother any of our LPs is that uh, we were very right 
shares immediately go back to 40 and uh, we make 100% but buying the shares would have given us 300%. And uh, of course, you don't hear many complaints about it, but, uh, but that's an unfortunate scenario as well because you, you do miss the upside. And, um, and so that's sort of where you can go right and wrong and at a very high level how it works. Um, you do want to be very careful. You know, each option represents 100 shares. Uh, you know, I use these like a sort of pork belly future where I actually want the delivery of the pork belly. And uh, I think that's a very safe way to sort of utilize these. But you just need to be prepared to buy the things that you are committing to purchase uh, or you can find yourself in, in some trouble. Absolutely. And, and I actually, I, I think that's a perfect opportunity right here to say like, you know, when it comes to options and some of these more um, technical ways in which to be active in the market, I just want everybody to please be careful out there. You know, we've seen, especially with, with a, a lot of the news that we saw with hap, happening at Robinhood and a lot of new retail investors out there. Just please be very careful. Consult somebody that knows what they're doing uh, has done this kind of thing before, before you go out and, and do some, some of this stuff, you know, um, maybe listen to, to Matthew a little bit here because he's been doing this since 2005. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that uh, warning. And there's a lot of uh, material on my website also. There's actually not a lot that's publicly available about this strategy. Um, I sort of came up with the title Structured Value and I think it's kind of catching on, but, um, but I, you know, feel free to look through our website. You'll see a lot of information on it. Absolutely. All right. So, um, so another topic that I want to also cover here, because I, I think we really went through, we went through the basics of that strategy. I think, I think we more or less got what we could. And I wish I was smarter where I could take a deeper dive into it, but uh, that's the extent of my, my options knowledge right now is everything that you just said. Um, but so, you know, I want to, I want to now go into how you then value some of these companies that you're looking at deploying the strategy for, because I think you said something pretty interesting in terms of the uh, looking for off financial statement things, you know, understanding what some of these business models or what some of these companies are doing to unlock more value that may not be in the short term unlocking that value, but you're seeing the bigger picture in the long term in terms of maybe customer acquisition or just, customer loyalty because they're giving some sort of deal to keep them on board as a customer for the long term. So what are some of those business models that you've seen that have worked for you when you've evaluated some of these businesses? Yeah, it, it's a, it's a very great question. I think it's also sort of an evolution beyond some of the standard accounting practices that take place in a lot of the, the value investing community. Uh, I, I think it's probably best explained with an example. I tend, by the way, not to just sort of uh, talk about individual firms that we own due to like commitment and consistency biases. However, there are some that are um, really the Phil Fisher uh, sort of models where they will compound and we will hold them for, you know, decades. And, um, and so for some of those, I've, I've determined that to be a little biased to hold those for a long time is actually okay. Uh, so I'll use this example. I, I've uh, spoken about this once or twice before, and it's this, um, the idea and the sort of off financial statement value affiliated with a uh, daily journal company. So, uh, and it, this can sort of feed through a lot of the discussion we had prior where I said 13F analysis is a good place to start. Uh, emphasis on start because there's actually not a lot of funds out there that own Daily Journal, uh, but Daily Journal, as many of your listeners and viewers will recognize, is um, run by Charlie Munger and Rick Gurin. Uh, they purchased the company about 43 years ago. It was a newspaper business, and there's this huge misconception about what the business is today. Uh, over the last four decades, uh, they've accumulated 10 legal newspapers. Munger, of course, has a legal background. And, uh, and now, to the, and by the way, it fits right in uh, to Planet Microcap because it's truly a microcap. And I think, uh, you know, people should really be aware of the law of large numbers, especially in today's environment when you have these firms that are hitting like a $1.5 trillion market cap. Uh, there's just not as much uh, p potential for them to double, triple, and certainly not, you know, be a hundred bagger. 
if you start out at that size. Um, but if you get into a really nice gem that's small, you do have that potential. And so uh, Daily Journal, for a bit of background, I've been studying the firm for about 10 years. We probably made our first investment two years ago. So uh, I, take, I take my time with our analysis. And uh, a few years back, I've been attending the, the annual meetings in Los Angeles for, for a decade. Uh, and Munger and uh, his exceptional board of directors started talking a little bit about this technology piece that they were building. And that's where the misconception is. They um, have basically pieced together a few firms and built a SaaS business model, which is one of the best business models available today, uh, software as a service. And they have uh, pivoted to this um, government and specifically courthouse uh, SaaS uh, software solution where they obtain these 10 year contracts. They have a three year sort of RFP, three to four year RFP and implementation period. And, uh, and all of this has been, is being done without any major impact to the financial statements right now. So the world is looking at Daily Journal as a dying newspaper business. Uh, but there's three aspects. There's newspapers. They built an equity portfolio that's about half the current market cap. Uh, let's say the current market cap is around 400 million. And uh, and then they have a this SaaS business model. And I recognize that nobody was uh, had a, had very much information at all about this. Uh, in fact, most people didn't even realize it existed. Very smart people. And uh, so I found a conference where they were training their, their uh, new customers in Utah. I couldn't get in because you needed a government ID, but I was able to book a room in the uh, hotel. And so I sat in the lobby for three days and I interviewed uh, all of their customers as they were switching between these rooms. And I realized so many things. First of all, everybody loves the product. Uh, but what I real and second of all, everybody that uses the product is in it all day long. So it's not like your, your browser, your um, Microsoft Office, or whatever it is, you're, this is how they're using this software. So it's, it's very sticky, it's very necessary. Uh, but one of the most important aspects of it was this deferred gratification component. So what I realized is that uh, their competitors were out there filling out these RFPs and billing them from day one. Whereas Daily Journal uh, has plenty of money, doesn't need the cash, uh, up front. And so they're doing this multi-year, uh, Munger has said it can take up to seven year implementation and before billing anything. And they have no deferred revenue on their financial statements. Uh, and they justify it by saying, if the customer ever determines that they're not going to accept our product, they don't have to pay us. And so it is totally absent from their financial statements. So I went and I hired a great intern, Daniel Segundo, a few years, a couple years ago, and we had to find what was missing. So we went county by county uh, across America and looked at the meeting minutes of different municipalities to find out what they said they owed to this company, Daily Journal or Journal Technologies or any of the pieces. And what did we find? We found that LA owed them $5 million. We found that Austin, Texas owed him a million dollars. We found Surprise Arizona owes him $25,000. We found out that Australia owes them $89 million. And it's all missing from their financial statements. And so that's what I'm talking about when I say they've got deferred gratification moats. I mean, what RFP would you expect? Would you accept the RFP that gives you a great IRR because your cash flow doesn't go out the door until year four, five, six, seven? Or the RFP that gives you a negative IRR because you got to do all your investment up front. Of course, you're much more likely to accept the, the RFP uh, that gives you the higher IRR from a municipality's perspective. Uh, but then the long-term aspect of this is extraordinarily sticky. These are actually government workers. And if you give them a 10-year software program that they learn, uh, there's zero interest in switching. A switching cost is extraordinarily high. And so, uh, you know, they get in, they've dropped all these seeds. We found hundreds of contracts. Uh, we found tens of millions of missing 
uh, dollars, not including the Australian, uh, which is the largest that we found is 89 million. Uh, and then there's an ongoing recurring revenue, which is consistent with SaaS, very high margins. Uh, and so we expect them to have about 150 million in revenue annually by the end of this decade. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's all I can say. I mean, that's, I don't even know how you, you thought to even really look there, you know, and, and understand that and to really think, okay, they're doing this. At, I mean, I mean, obviously this is all public information in terms of that they were developing this SaaS technology, but to take it to that next level and say, you know what? I want to find out a little bit more about it and see how they're actually deploying this technology. It sounds like, you know, it, it reminds me, especially in microcap land, and this is a much more high level version is, you know, you see all these companies that maybe have a different type of name or corporate name that, that they have. And yet when you just dive in just a little bit deeper, you know, the main thing that might reflect the name, or maybe it was a shell and, or they took the shell name and yet now it's a tech name. You know, it, it reminds me of those. There's That's so right. Many, so many opportunities in microcap like that. Well, Daily Journal is in fact the name of their primary newspaper. And, and that causes some of the misconception. But think for a moment. So this, this is a perfect example of finding an exceptional business model with extraordinary management. This is like the best management team in maybe the history of business. Okay, this is like you know, Peter Kaufman's on the board, Rick Gurren, who was one of the super investors of Graham and Doddsville's on the board. Charlie Munger is the chairman of the board and they have handpicked a staff of about 350 people over four decades. So the quality is very deep. I recognize just like everyone else that Munger's 96 years old and he's not gonna live forever. So, uh, but there's depth in that management. And so management is extraordinary. The business model is extraordinary. And because of the off financial statement value that exists, the value is extraordinary. And, uh, and so it's, it's just a, a really, really great example of when you get in the micro cap space, how uh, some, you know, maybe some things aren't quite as they appear. Absolutely. Well, on, on both sides, of course, <laughs> but, 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 but we'll, we'll, that's, a, that's a topic for another day. Um, that's right. That's right. It can be the, can go the other way. Can go the other way. Uh, <laughs> so, so, I, so I want to get back into um, some more current events, you know, right now a, a, in that, you know, we're, we're currently in the pandemic. We're, we're all going through one way or another, you know, would you say your strategy has changed at all one way or another, or would you say you've actually seen more opportunities and, and, and do, and actually executing more trades as a result? You know, that's, it's, it's a very good question. It's a very deep question also. I think, uh, you know, I, I think as most portfolio managers would tell you, uh, the, I think the, the, the process and philosophy uh, evolves and hopefully slowly improves over time. There's almost a, a little compounding nature to your own strategy. Uh, and this is a huge new data point. Uh, so I don't think there's a line in the sand where I would say prior to COVID, I thought X and now I think Y. But, uh, but I, will, I will sort of make myself vulnerable and say that I have recognized for a number of years that I am overly focused on some of the older school businesses, the book values of these companies. Um, and I've been less attracted to these capital light businesses that have, uh, you know, maybe no cash flows to speak of today, but potential for large cash flows in the future. And, uh, and that's caused me to miss some great opportunities as we've all seen, right? During this period, technology has in fact thrived and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the older business models have, have um, stagnated, fallen, and they've stayed down. And I don't think they'll stay down forever, by the way, but, um, but I do personally recognize that there's a need to shift my mindset into a capital light business model. And by the way, 
Daily Journal is a perfect example of the capital light uh, sort of SaaS business model that I'm looking for. Uh, but I, I do want to sort of explore personally um, some of these harder to understand new age business models. Um, you know, what is, for example, Uber worth? Is Uber really changing the whole dynamic of transportation? I'm a, I'm a user of Uber, uh, but I don't own any Uber. And uh, I don't want to regret uh, not owning any Uber because it seems pretty uh, obvious that it's going to be part of the world and part of everyone's lives for, for a long uh, time to come. And in fact, a good friend of mine, uh, Vitaly Katznelson, uh, recently wrote about this topic, and I think he described it as um, bytes versus atoms. And, uh, and I thought it was a really clever way to sort of describe it. You know, the atom businesses sort of um, are required to keep the bytes businesses uh, growing and accelerating. So there is a place for both. Uh, but, but the capital light business model is, is very attractive, especially if you can reinvest some cash flows, generate your own cash flows internally, reinvest them um, at high rates of return. Uh, it's, a, it's a great place to be. And so that's sort of my own evolution that's happening, I think, at the moment. And, and certainly COVID uh, and this experience is, has helped push me in that direction. By the way, Vitaly, great friend of the show. We love Vitaly here. So I, I highly recommend everybody listen to his podcast too, Contrarian Edge. That, and, and, or I think that's his website. And then he also has a podcast. He's a brilliant guy. You know, also, also thankful, shout out to Alex Rubalcava for connecting us on this. So I, that's I right. want to make sure that uh, they, they got their kudos. Um, that's right. But yeah, no, but going back to what you just said, I mean, that's, that's pretty interesting. I mean, you know, in ter I know a lot of people were thinking about this time period in terms of timing, like, okay, well, when's, how do we time the bottom? And, you know, is it going to be a fast or long recovery? I mean, as a portfolio manager, that to some level, that must have drove you nuts a little bit. Yeah, you know, I've been, uh, I've been on the bullish side of this more so than, than many. I would say more so than most. Um, I sort of recognize, I'm a big fan of Jeremy Siegel and I have been for a long time. I sort of recognize uh, stocks for the long run. And even if you wipe away this year's earnings completely, and I think the S&P, we're expecting sort of a 30% decline in earnings in 2020. If you were to just eliminate them completely and then just discount and then kind of get back to 2019 levels in 2021, just sort of discount that back, it might cost five, six, seven percent uh, in the marketplace. But the intrinsic value isn't completely eroded or destroyed. Uh, I, this is, it's a very strange, uh, we were forced to do something very strange and sort of uh, stop the economy, stop demand, stop supply. Uh, but as long as things open up, I know we're in a period right now where we're opening up and there are some spikes and I expect there to be some spikes, but I have been very uh, optimistic about the future of investing. And I expect, uh, I expect actually we'll be uh, doing quite well in, in the coming quarters and, and years. So, uh, so to that regard, I will also point out that rather than timing the bottom, if you sell a put, you no longer have to time the bottom. Uh, you can put a, a, a very nice price, collect a very nice IRR, um, evaluate in a rational mindset what you'd be willing to pay for this company. Uh, you can have that expiration out six months or 12 months from today when a lot of this will be um, over, uh, potentially 12 months or 18 months. And, uh, and now you've sort of picked up a premium that gives you big margin of safety. So you no longer really need to focus on market timing. And, um, and market timing, of course, uh, especially for anybody who's, who's new to this, it, it just doesn't work. So um, even if you get lucky and sell at the right time, uh, you, you most likely won't get lucky and buy at the right time. So anybody who thought they were brilliant for selling in, in uh, January uh, has probably missed uh, this huge upside. Oh, I, I would say that's what I attribute to my terrible investorness is that my timing, always horrible, always yeah. the worst. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll chalk that up. It's, it's look, no, <laughs> real, really nobody has a, has a crystal ball. There are too many factors to possibly evaluate. And really what you're evaluating in the short term is, is the, the market dynamics, the market psychology of every, of the aggregate of market participants. 
So, uh, I mean, who's going to also incorporate in their thesis on whether we're at the bottom or not, that there's uh, potentially a bunch of millennials and sports bettors that can no longer uh, gamble and they want to start putting money into the markets. And, um, and there's just too many factors to possibly uh, be right about timing. Uh, it's, it's much more, people will argue, by the way, that Buffett is timing markets by holding cash and things like that. But really what he's doing is he's looking for the appropriate opportunity cost and, um, and trying to find the adequate IRR that will justify spending that cash. So when there are fewer opportunities available, cash piles up. It looks like market timing because things are more expensive, but actually he can't find the opportunities to deploy the capital. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, even the best avoid market timing. Absolutely. All right. So we're getting to my favorite question that I love to ask every guest on here. And I think everybody is so annoyed whenever I preface it with that saying, but I don't care anyway, I'm going to still say. So, um, I have to ask you, Matthew, what would you say is what investing experience would you say impacted you the most in your career? I'm going to wager to bet it was in 2005 when you did your very first trade using your current strategy. It's, it's so hard to identify uh, a single, a single opportunity. Look, what has impacted my career? There, there have been a lot. And um, I'll, I'll just throw out a few that are probably among the top. If you just look at the, the trajectory, like a real impact. I, you know, I was in 2003, I was riding a New York subway with a friend and I was you know, kind of passionately describing Warren Buffett and um, all of his investment philosophies to this friend of mine who uh, asked immediately, well, have you been to the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting? And I hadn't. I didn't even really consider doing that. And I went home and I booked a flight. And, uh, you know, the next April I was in 2004, I was at my first Berkshire Hathaway meeting. And uh, now I've been to 16 and, and many, many of my best friends in my life uh, I've met through the Berkshire Hathaway meetings. And so that has certainly shaped in an enormous way uh, my career and my, my life. Um, I also think, you know, negative, uh, what does Howard Marks say? Uh, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. And so uh, negative uh, experiences tend to shape your career quite a bit. I was very involved with uh, with this company Horsehead a few years ago, uh, that was went through uh, this this technical uh, liquidity issue where management chose not to pay, make a bond payment, um, and use that um, missed payment to file uh, a prepackaged bankruptcy. Uh, it was uh, a fraudulent situation. I ended up on the equity committee with Guy Spear and a whole bunch of. Uh, other uh, incredible investors um, fighting in courts in Delaware. And that has certainly shaped, uh, you know, my investing career. So there are things that are positive uh, and things that are, that are negative. And um, so, and I, I think one thing I'll also add is that these sort of experiences compound. So I think uh, just, and there's more things that compound than just, finance, right? We all kind of think about businesses compound and we want our portfolios to compound, which is why incidentally, uh, Phil Fisher investments are preferred over Ben Graham investments because Ben Graham, you have to interrupt your compounding and then find a new opportunity and usually pay taxes in the interim. Phil Fisher, you just get to let the compounding do its work, but there's, uh, you know, relationships compound, knowledge compounds. Um, you might even think that in some ways, running this podcast and having these these viewers and subscribers in a way, in a way that's like, that's the compounding uh, thing in life. And I think the more you can kind of collect those, uh, those, those nice little nuggets, um, it, it gives you a big push forward in ways that, that you didn't expect over a little period of time. Absolutely. Abs I, I couldn't agree with that sentiment more. So, so then, and by the way, I should have, put the joke in when I said, I want to wager to bet that it was the 2000. I should have said, I want to sell a put at $4. That that's it was, right. That, that's what I should have. That, <laughs> that shows I'm learning a little bit today. That's I, right. I, I think, I, think I, I probably should have said that. I, I, you know, I apologize to my, I'm so sorry. 
Um, so, <laughs> so, so then, you know, uh, Matthew, what, what? But that fits in there, by the way. So don't, you, you weren't, you were not wrong. I well, know was, I didn't list it, but was, was, discovering, was, discovering the combination of structured products um, as tools to buy equity was pretty transformational as well. I thought you were going to say, yeah, no, the four, that might've been a little too, that, that was, that was a little too high. You should have gone a little too expensive. You should have, yeah. you should have gone two <laughs> and then it's, and then, you know, it gets in that three range and you would, yeah. uh, good. So, uh, right. so Matthew, what, what advice then would you say, do, do you have for new investors that are looking at investing in the stock market right now? You know, there's so much advice. I think, um, for new investors, uh, you can really you can really start by um, studying the greats, uh, looking at 13 Fs. Uh, things don't need to be totally original, uh, so that's that's all fine. A kind of fair and good advice. I think you know, especially pertaining to this podcast, one really good piece of advice is not to ignore the law of large numbers. So if you look at companies now like the Fangs, uh, and you look at something like say Microsoft, which is an outstanding company, outstanding management. It might even be a pretty decent value. I don't, you know, I think it sells for 33 times earnings or something. Um, but, you know, they've got a lot of great businesses and a lot of great business models. Uh, but it's a $1.5 trillion business. And I think the U.S., entire U.S. market cap's about $35 trillion. Uh, and that's maybe growing slowly, but it's very difficult for a company like Microsoft to triple from here. Uh, suddenly for Microsoft to be a four and a half trillion, I mean, you get, you drop off really quickly. I don't know where Netflix is, but maybe it's fifth on the list or Facebook and they're down in like the 600 billion range. So Microsoft's at 1.5 trillion. So do you want to own a $1.5 trillion business? and then hope that it doubles or triples, which is very difficult. Um, or do you wanna own a business that's a $300 million business, like a Seritage or a Daily Journal, that has potential to go 10X and be only 3 billion? Maybe it can go 100X, be 30 billion? Uh, there's, a, there's a book out there called 100 Baggers um, by Christopher Meyer. And uh, you know he, he sort of lays out a lot of the criteria that you would look for if you're trying to capture something. And Hunter Bayer, of course, is a, a company that would, or an investment that would sort of go from 10,000 to a million. Uh, and, you know, part of the criteria for that is to look in uh, smaller places. The company has to start relatively small to go up 100x. Uh, you just can't do that with an Amazon or a Microsoft today. And, uh, and so, you know, I think it's worth telling people to focus on some smaller businesses. Hey, that's what that's what we exist for. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, real quick, are you currently a shareholder in? I think you said in any of the Fang stocks or Microsoft. Uh, no, not at the moment. Regretfully, so I wish we I wish we had. <laughs> but uh, no, we we are focused. Uh, we're we are focused uh, elsewhere. Gotcha. All right. So with that, Matthew, we're there. Where can my audience go and find everything? they need to know about you and Peterson Capital Management? I, I think the best way, the best thing is to, to go to our website, uh, petersonfunds.com. Anybody can um, quickly find my, my email address, uh, phone numbers, things like that there. Uh, and so that's a great place to start. There's so much material there. We have 10 years of, of letters, uh, media appearances, et cetera. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk with people who are, uh, you know, interested in um, what we're doing, interested in um, being investors, or just interested in, in understanding more about, you know, uh, even how we, how we sell put contracts as a tool to buy the equity. Because, um, <clears throat> we, you know, I, I enjoy helping people and, and building their wealth. Absolutely. Well, th Matthew, thank you so much for joining me today. That was a ton of fun. I, 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 and I'm very excited to have you back on at some point. That was great, Robert. Yeah, I really appreciate it.